Good afternoon. Welcome to our Friday lunch forum where sandwich eating and potato chip bag crinkling over Zoom are totally okay. Uh, I am Leora Vysotsky. I'm the staff managing director here at the center, which is also run by a faculty board of directors from across our programs. This year, it consists of Fernando Lara, Miriam Solis, Martin Hadish, Nerea Feliz, and Alex Yeshka. Lunch forums that are in this dialogue format like today are really meant to straddle our disciplines at the school and to explore possibilities for new collaboration, hear about different approaches to topics in common, or to debate uh, uncommon ground. So uh, our presenters today will talk for about 45 minutes with each other, after which we'll open the floor to questions and discussion. So please feel free to raise your hand or put a question or comment in the chat just as they arise. Um, I am pleased to introduce our faculty participants today to discuss modeling data. Corey Beeg will go first, or I will present his bio first. He's an associate professor of architecture at UT Austin. He received his MRC from Columbia University and is a registered architect in California and Texas. Since 2013, he has served as chair of the TXA Emerging Design and Technology Conference and co-director of TexFab Digital Fabrication Alliance. He has also served on the board of South by Southwest Eco Place by Design and the Association for Computer Aided Design and Architecture. In 2005, Corey founded ODA Plus, an architecture design and research office that specializes in the development and use of current new and emerging digital technologies, technologies for design and fabrication of buildings, building components and experimental installations. ODA Plus uses current design software and CNC machine tools to generate and construct conceptually rigorous and formally unique design proposals. Next up is Alex Karner, who is an assistant professor in the graduate program in community and regional planning at UT Austin. His work critically engages with the practice of transportation planning with the goal of achieving progress towards equity and sustainability. To this end, he develops innovative methods for analyzing the performance of integrated transportation land use systems in the areas of civil rights, environmental justice, public health, and climate change. His research has been supported by the Federal Transit Administration, the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, the California Endowment, and State Departments of Transportation in Georgia and Texas, among other organizations. Last up is Marla Smith, who has been a lecturer at the UT Austin School of Architecture since 1997, instructing various courses, including visual communications, technical communications, design to studio, advanced design studio, building information modeling, and individual instruction. She was a partner with Christy Seals in loop design and is currently in individual architectural practice as M. Smith Workshop. And she also contracts with various firms in and around Austin. Corey, Alex, and Marla, thank you so much for being here. You can take it away. Sure. Um, well, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, we all sort of had a short discussion and our format for this afternoon is we're gonna each present um, a very brief uh, slideshow and talk about a topic that we are interested in and then sort of open it up and, and, and talk amongst each other, but also open it up for general conversation at that point. And so um, the way we kind of divided it up is I, I kind of took the academic part of it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how I teach modeling data, you know, within the school, since that's sort of my primary my primary practice here. Um, I teach with Corey and the visual communications for the undergraduates, and I also teach technical communications and then also some summer courses in building information modeling. So that's sort of where I'm going to start off. You go ahead and share my screen. So what I'd like to talk about a little bit, um, I have a few slides, um, just sort of my approach, which is really the way I start with students, which is kind of fun. I, I, I like to talk to them about how I approach digital modeling and modeling data. And it's really about the process of building up from like a noun which I see as data and a verb, which I see as a parameter, which is actually movable data. And then moving into sort of open command structure and then into a paragraph, which is actually really where I think the core of modeling data lives, which is actually controlling the process of the way that the data comes in because the data is pretty undifferentiated. And then that process begins to build a story. And so I start to talk to the students 
about how they develop a digital conversation with their data and their process and their goals based on the tool that they have. And a lot of times to me, it's not, the tool is not the thing. It's really more about understanding how to converse productively with the data and the tool and develop a process that you're comfortable with and choosing that process. So on the right hand side here is, um, I'm not going to go through my whole lecture on it, but I, I like to talk about the relationship that I have and the conversations that I have and the personalities that I give to the tools that I use based on what I'm trying to do. So on the left hand side over here, you'll see a series of sort of characters. And then over here, you'll see a series of tools that we're all familiar with obviously a very small sort of sect of those tools. And then the personalities that I kind of couple with them in order to have a conversation. And the other thing that I talk about with the students is that my goal for them is not necessarily to learn how to use the tool really, really well. My goal for them is to learn how the tool thinks, like how, how can you have a conversation with this tool and know not only how to use it well and how its process works, but also how when not to use it. So it's really, and also how to win an argument, you know, with it, like you want to have a nice conversation, but sometimes you don't get along and you want to be able to win an argument. And the only way to know how to do that is to actually understand how the, how the data is going in and how it's being processed. So. Whoops. So the way that I sort of structure my classes and I, and Corey can jump into it at some point when I start talking about VizCom. Um, is I, I begin to actually introduce the students in the very first projects to a predefined story. So everything's already there. I give them a template so they can go in and start working with the data and understand data not only as a noun, but as a verb, as a parameter, as an open sort of source where they can start to manipulate it. Because a lot of times what I get with my students, um, graduate and undergraduate, is that they're used to abstract modeling where it's all a little bit baked. It's getting, um, the process is getting much easier since in VizCom we've actually introduced Grasshopper um, much earlier than we have in the past. And so we're, I'm getting students that have an idea of process, but oftentimes with the grad students with no background, they don't have that. And so we sort of transition, I give them an environment to work in, not only to succeed within that environment, but also hopefully to fail in a predetermined and controlled environment and start to understand how that data processing is working. Um, and then the next project is I go in and sort of talk about how to create their own template once they've sort of become a little uncomfortable or had some success in a previous one and how to do that. Um, and then the next process that I go into is I actually start to talk about like now that you've created your own template and you become comfortable in an environment with data and parameters and started to construct some sentences that create your own environment, we start to recreate an existing story through systematic process investigation into the program, which right now I'm talking about Revit, but I'll sort of transition into Grasshopper and Rhino. And then the final is actually the easiest project because they get to direct their story. They actually begin to create their own parameters and define what they want. And so it's almost like we start at the end, pick up the beginning, and then at the very uh, end, they actually sort of flow back to the beginning. So if I go to the next slide, you can see that here's just some visual representation of those projects. So over here is that first project where I give them sort of a really almost rigid template and they begin to push data into it. So the data would be the masses and the template begins to analyze those masses and they begin to understand how to control how they're dissecting that mass. And they're also getting data that's getting pushed back and forth and then they also transition from that to um, elemental or uh, tectonic transitions and see how that data changes and see how when they push the mass around the data updates. And they also look over here at sort of more standardized ways of representation, but how it changes when you actually get parametric and those things are all connected. Um, and then over here on the right hand side is the template creation. So this is where they start to actually make their own parameters define their own environment and go back and affect this environment with what they want to create. 
And you can kind of see down here in the third project, they begin to implement that. And I guess I should mention also that in TechCom, I have uh, uh, part of the process is teaching them construction documentation, which is, um, which is a lot of fun. Uh, but one of the ironies, and I think it's actually a really useful tool, is that I'm teaching building information modeling and data processing, but we're doing it as sort of creating, we talk about the irony of creating a better mousetrap, like we're actually using building information modeling to create better 2D drawing sets, which is crazy because we've got this 3D drawing. And so we, there's a really nice sort of conversation that happens during this process where they see the parametric possibilities, but then the irony of what sometimes we do, which is produce old things better and then see the horizon beyond that, which is to push to more data-driven representation and construction. And then finally, and this is just a little short example, they actually begin to work on their own projects and begin to explore how the data and the different parts of the projects work. Um, if I go to this next slide, this is VizCon, so Corey will be familiar with this. And I, I really feel like we approach it similarly in VizCom, where we begin with the construction of processes, even with circles, like how to make a, have 50 different ways to make a circle, 30 different ways to make a triangle. So we're starting out at the very sort of parametric base, and then they build up. And it's not so much the thing, like the column or the circle or the square or the pavilion that they're creating, but the process that they're using to get to it because you can push any data in there and it's really more about the organization of your process and the understanding of your process that gives you different results and why you would do that. And so one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is um, this would be an example of one of our projects at the end where you have to create a board, which is sort of traditional in architecture. So you get the board of the thing, right? Here's the thing and we're gonna talk about the thing. But I think one of the things that is really successful with the implementation of a parametric um, process and particularly grasshopper is that we've actually asked them to start um, giving us videos of their process. So this is, I'm not gonna run through this whole video, but I'll kind of skip through where they actually show us how they're making the thing that they are. And they're very conscious of how they're putting this together and each step and how that step and the data that they put into that step gets them to what would typically be the final point, right? Where a lot of times what we're just looking at at the end is this, but if you really look and have the opportunity, this is their whole process, right? And so I think it's really powerful for them to go through and actually document their process and have to show it to us and organize it and understand each piece of it because I think that this actually translates into quite a bit more understanding of everything that they do. So go ahead and go back to this guy. Okay. Um, and here's a few more projects from VizCom. Um, this is a final uh, that Corey and I kind of separate, but I think that the process is the same is that it's really the story at the end. So these are images of uh, renderings that, um, that Corey, one of Corey's modules shows, but it's it's about the process of using all of those steps in between and that these actually tell quite a robust story about all those processes. And then here um, you can actually see them starting to translate sort of the programmatic understanding of what they've been using in Grasshopper to presentation purposes. So you actually get them understanding that not only does this apply to modeling, but it applies to sort of the potentially to the overall process that they're using. So it's not so much about the data going in, but the way that they're controlling the data. It could be modeling data, it could be visual data, it could be presentation data, just about anything. And they can start to control those bits and pieces and really tell a story. So if we take a look, we'll go to this guy. Here's an example of one of their projects that they did and instead of just having a static piece, we had them do a, um, a, a connected panorama through panoramas and stills. And so you can see, you can click through and see different pieces. And so I really do think that overall, the way that we're working with the students, really, it really makes a difference in terms of 
them understanding the process and the pieces that go into the process. But for me, it's really more about the paragraph and understanding how that thing works over and over again. Um, and then I had a couple of, we, you know, we were tasked with having a couple of questions um, about, you know, what is of interest to me? Like what really comes and sort of talks to me and about how my process of teaching has changed over time based on the, the implementation of massive amounts of data. Um, and one of them is the limits of the conversation between the tools with the data is really one of the biggest um, hurdles that we're trying to get over. And so how important is it that we now know and are sort of developing students and bases of, that know how to code? They don't necessarily have to be coders, but they have to understand how that process works so they can actually break through the walls that are separating the tools because you're starting to see all of these combinations of data flow back and forth. Um, and then eventually, will all the data become accessible through a matrix of plug-in options, which you're starting to see that. Like, I don't know, um, Corey, if you've used it yet, but they have a, Rhino has actually developed a way to get into the Revit memory space. So now you can actually use Rhino within Revit, which means you can use Grasshopper within Revit. And you're starting to see this sort of plethora of plugins that are connecting intelligent data. And so I think that's one of the things that um, interests me the most is how to sort of begin to undifferentiate the data and have it be intelligent and cross-platform. Um, and then I'll just finish with, you know, charts and graphs because you should always finish with charts and graphs. One of the, I mean, there's multiple other things that I talked to the students about. Um, one is the transition up at the top from analog creation to parametric um, generative design and how that works. But one of the biggest things that I talked to them about is the proliferation of data over time. Um, and some of these charts are talking about how data is used. And, and some of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with some of these. Um, and how really what we're doing now is managing data. You have to figure out how to manage that data and get it into a process that's productive for you. Um, and the, the data is undifferentiated often. Well, it depends on how it's collected, but that the really what you're in control of is the process. All right. How long was that? Was that five minute ish? Let me stop my share. I don't know, Corey, if you wanted to add anything to that. I don't know. I think we could talk about it later. I mean, I think what was interesting is a lot of that work, almost all of it is work from this last semester yeah. where we were entirely online and in Zoom, which which also was part of the um, kind of uh, representation of the, the class as well. Yeah. So I mean, it was interesting. It's all, all Karn or Alex now. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, it's exciting. Oh, my phone just uh, decided to ring. Um, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. I will say that it's uh, it's pretty exciting to be part of this interdisciplinary conversation. And I, as Marla was talking, uh, it became clear to me that the ways that each of our disciplines and each of us individually thinks about what these words even mean is gonna be pretty different. Um, so I'm gonna give, um, folks a kind of sense of how I think about uh, what uh, modeling data is. Um, and I did see some nice points of overlap and connection uh, between what you just presented, Marla, and what I'm going to talk about, although that may not be obvious immediately, <laughs> kind of uh, clarify those points afterwards. So as I was thinking about what I was going to present, um, I was going to talk about some specific projects, but then it became clear to me that um, I've been thinking about modeling and data for a really long time. So this is an image of uh, University of Toronto where I went to college. I studied civil engineering um, and my background is in uh, transportation systems. So I study uh, transportation planning and, and policy. And in the transportation world, especially in civil engineering, models and data reign supreme, right? So we've got um, at every large region across the United States, there's some back room that has a computer in it that has some kind of uh, large simulation model known as a, a travel demand model. Um, and for the uninitiated, a, a travel demand model is just a series of statistical models that are linked together in various ways um, to give us a sense for how people will travel. 
uh, given a different set of transportation infrastructures um, that they face. So a certain public transit system, a certain set of highways, um, and potentially a non-motorized network, uh, bike and, and ped paths. Um, we take all that information, we get information about socio-demographic conditions, feed it through these statistical equations, and then produce the output. Um, so a lot of work in transportation studies is focused on refining um, those models, uh, making them more complex, using new and emerging data sources, trying to model travel behavior related to scooters and ride sharing, uh, Uber and Lyft, et cetera. So tons of intellectual firepower aimed at doing a better job at modeling transportation and land use systems. And I, I thought that if we could do that, if we could just get the models right, if we could do a better job at modeling, we could solve a, a whole host of problems. Everything that was uh, plaguing humanity, climate change, uh, environmental collapse, if we just understood how to get the transportation system uh, performing in a certain way through modeling, we could get it in the real world. Um, of course, I, I went to graduate school and I now realize that that's not the case, um, that we, we have more sophisticated models now and that hasn't necessarily led to better decision-making. There's a lot of reasons for that. So I've got a couple examples here um, that I think drive this point home that I use in some of my teaching. So one is um, this case of a law that was passed in California in 2008, right around when I was uh, finishing up my master's degree. It's called SB 375. Um, so I know there are a lot of acronyms on this slide. I hope that's not off-putting here, but it, the, in a nutshell, the goal of SB 375 was to reduce driving in California, to produce uh, transportation systems, to provide housing and job choices that would encourage people to drive less. The linchpin of SB 375 was modeling, was better data and better models. So these transportation planning agencies across the state fired up their travel demand models. They looked 30 years into the future. They said, great, we know how to put things together, uh, the right mix of transportation infrastructure and land uses to get what we need. And they, they predicted these green dots, right? We're gonna have this amount of carbon emissions in 2020 and then this amount of carbon emissions in 2035. But if you look at the lines, the yellow and blue lines here, VMT is uh, vehicle miles traveled. It's just a measure of driving. You can see that they were, the lines were trending downward as the housing collapse uh, was happening, but then they started to trend upwards as the economy uh, uh, recovered. So we had a case where the models that these agencies were producing were showing a decline, but the real world conditions didn't actually match. And the reasons for this are, are legion, uh, having to do with political will, uh, kind of fragmented governance um, in the state, uh, the power of housing developers um, to, uh, to kind of dictate policy at the local level. Um, but we were spending a lot of money and a lot of time <clears throat> on modeling in California and elsewhere and not really getting much uh, for it. So this is a case where the models were showing trends going down, um, but trends were actually going up. There are tons of examples of the opposite case as well. So these are, this is an older example, but I, I use this one in class a lot too. So all of the, the lines here, the blue lines and the dash lines, these are projections, uh, again, for the amount of driving that the federal government um, ma has made over the years. So the, the bottom part of the line will show the year the projection was made. And you can see basically whatever models they were using were really good at just extrapolating the past trend. So whenever that uh, projection was made, they just kind of extrapolated and said, yeah, we think driving is gonna go up in the future. But again, if you look because of external economic conditions, because of energy prices, actual driving kind of plateaued um, in the early aughts and that trend continued. It's ticked up um, now, but, but even as driving was plateauing, the uh, Federal Highway Administration was uh, predicting these increases in driving. So models really good at projecting this past trend in this case, but really bad at um, kind of dealing with unexpected events. We have another example of this really close to home uh, in the freeze where ERCOT's models um, dramatically underestimated the amount of electricity that would be needed um, in a disaster. So there are all these instances where models are being used to predict the future, right? To argue that, okay, in 20 years, in 30 years, we are going to um, have X amount of driving, but it's just not really the case. And, and we kind of know this, there's academic literature, um, telling us that models should not be used in this way. They should not be used to uh, 
uh, kind of predict the future with, uh, um, uh, with, with high degrees of precision, but we keep doing it, right? We keep thinking about models as crystal balls. And so what I try to do in my teaching and, and in my work is, is get away from these ideas of models um, as crystal balls and really try to ingrain in my students that uh, you, you, you can estimate a model with the best data and the most sophisticated analytical techniques you have available at the time. Um, but the, you're not gonna be able to anticipate unexpected conditions. Your input data might be flawed. The relationships that are inherent in your model might also um, be uh, incorrect or inaccurate. And so what I try to argue for is using models as a way of understanding what different possible futures could be. Um, so understanding that at every step along the way, there are uncertainties that are inherent in your data, uh, whether it's on the input side or on the statistical modeling side. Um, so having one model run that represents the future um, is not um, is usually not going to be adequate. Um, instead, we need to test uh, lots of different kind of ranges of inputs. We have to understand how the uh, uncertainty in our inputs affects our outputs, and then use models as a tool uh, on from the planning side to help communities understand how their um, uh, how how different futures can kind of play out given a range of different inputs. Um, so that's uh, kind of where I landed, going all the way from models will save us to now. Well, I think models can help us understand kind of different futures. So if we want to have a kind of climate, um, a, a future in which driving is reduced, which in which greenhouse gas emissions go down, we know what we need to do to get there. But then there's this piece of kind of connecting it to the real world and understanding how that plays out within a given political economy to actually realize those outcomes. Um, so different than um, Marla's presentation, but uh, I look forward to uh, hearing what Corey has to say as well and then being in discussion with you all. Great, thanks Alex. I think mine is maybe a good uh, bridge between the two actually, so we'll see how this um, goes. All right, so, so I think um, I'm going to break this up into kind of two halves. The first will be higher level thoughts about data and the use of data. And then the second will be a series of projects in which we have used data in one way or another. So for the overview for the higher level, I'll go back to Alberti because I'm an architect. Um, data and architecture have been interwoven uh, since Alberti helped shift the role of architects as builders to architects as designers. Um, as Mario Carpo points out in his book, The Alphabet and the Algorithm, Alberti completely transformed the practice of architecture by, by promoting this use of notation and orthographic drawing as an intermediate step between the building's conception as an idea and then the construction of a building by someone else. So the drawing became the information, it became the data, and, and that was relayed between one person performing one task and then another using that information to perform another task. So much like a computer today, the drawing compressed the information into something smaller, which we might refer to as bits or data, which the, the builder then later unzipped into the actual building. So of course, this idea of using data to act as a stand-in for some other information is something that has continued in our profession. Data or the use of data, what we call big data, is now ubiquitous. It's connected to everything we do, every decision we make, and every analysis we make about some aspect of our world. And even though it can be, it is incredibly useful, it's also very dangerous. And uh, especially when we assume that uh, data is equal to truth. So as architects, as designers, we need to be, be aware of this misuse of data and how data is used in order to leverage it toward better designs. So in my work, I always approach data with a few kind of universal higher level checks. I don't pretend that I always achieve these, these things, but I do make sure that um, whatever I do design uh, fits within the umbrella. So never, never falls outside of this umbrella. Um, the first is that data must be transparent. Uh, we should be highly skeptical of data that is hidden or that has not been easily verified or can't be verified. Um, in fact, I discount pretty much any data that is just casually thrown out as stats to defend a position. We see it all the time. It's a red herring. I see it constantly uh, in most of the work that I do. Um, and there's a good book by Kathy O'Neill. She wrote a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, WMDs, in which she lists many ways in which data is misused from anywhere from teacher evaluations to admissions processes, to advertising, to job searches, time and time again, the greatest misuse of data is when we use it to justify our assumptions. So it's incredibly easy to find data that we need for a particular outcome that we hope to be true. 
Um, the best way around this is to be clear, it's to be transparent, it's to make our sources open to the public gaze about what data is being used and how it's being used, um, which isn't to say that data can't be frivolous, it can be frivolous, but it, it can't be used if it's frivolous to make and defend a non-frivolous claim, which is what we see quite often. So the only way to prevent that, I think, is through transparency. Uh, blockchain, for example, is a, is a good example of transparent data. It's built on transparency. Uh, blockchain is essentially a public ledger that is constantly scrutinized. It's distributed, so it's not a hierarchical uh, uh, construct. It's um, permanent, so it can't be edited or destroyed, which prevents it and protects it from being altered. And so it is what it is, which, which I think is a really good example of, of transparent data. Um, the second is that data must be both generic and specific. Um, if we're to understand patterns and draw conclusions from data, we need to look at it broadly over a large sample size. And at the same time, we need to be careful of smoothing over anomalies when we induce facts, what we call facts or conclusions from general trends. Um, one of Bertrand Russell's, and this sort of connects to what you mentioned, Alex, about the projections of models. Um, so one of Bertrand Russell's famous responses to Hume's principle of induction was of course the inductivist turkey. The idea that a turkey would wake up every day, would feed at 9 a.m. over and over again, every day, every week, every month, and then therefore would induce the idea, the general rule, that feeding happens at 9 a.m., of course, until Thanksgiving comes around. So uh, these anomalies actually completely change the model. So while it's important to have enough data to draw conclusions, it's also important to not omit the data that doesn't support the overall story, and we need to hold both a general and specific view of the data we work with so we have a better picture of, of what we're working with. Um, the third is that data is a quantity. It's not a quality, but it must always be qualified. Um, and so in architecture, data often refers to measurements or width or angles or temperature or moisture. Um, but, it, but something is not better or worse because of data until it is qualified. So for example, I need two eggs, not one egg to make the best chocolate chip cookies. Um, for example. So some, sometimes the qualification can come from other data streams and it's a layering of those patterns uh, that reveal something emergent from them. Okay, so I'll quickly go through a few projects that, that uh, kind of represent this idea of using data uh, in different ways within architecture. Um, the first is Ondawall. So Ondawall was an installation at UT uh, completed with students in an advanced studio I taught a few years ago. Uh, the project was entirely the result of layering multiple streams of data to produce something more than each data source alone, each individual data source. Here are a few of the data streams. The first um, came from a, a program called Processing, uh, in which we used a, a Perlin noise algorithm, which is essentially an algorithm that generates a simulated natural pattern. Uh, and the goal is to produce a visual field that felt organic, it's non-repeating, and it's data that's generated by a computer based on uh, a scripts that other people have contributed to and created through a community exchange change and a community feedback. So they're all shared online. The second data stream is really a random data generation from the students in the class that was based on uh, iterative testing and students actually voting for which one they preferred. Uh, so kind of an internalized uh, data generation that distributed the material of the project into two. Uh, being, the first being HDPE, which is a translucent uniform plastic, and the second being um, MDF, which is highly changeable. And MDF allowed us, because of its flexibility as a material, to introduce other material properties or other conditions into that material um, and then link in other data sources through the manipulation of those properties like color or um, you know, even uh, um, opac or not opacity, but a a sheen of, of paint. The third is topography. Uh, and one of the topographies is a direct translation of Austin's topography. And then the other one is a 3D model form that we developed in the class. And so it represents again, uh, an idea of an external data stream being Austin and an internal data stream generated by the class itself. And then the final data stream is an anamorphic projection. And we considered this data of, uh, as a different kind altogether. So in this case, data, it's data that affects behavior and therefore your experience of the project. So from one vantage point, the projection snaps clearly into view and then from another it's distorted. So it sort of nudges you to search the design space and find uh, different moments of experiencing the project. So it, it actually affects behavior. Um, this is a, a slide of the assembly logic which is directly built into each piece. And I don't see this as a return to like a pre-Alberti architects as builders model. 
but rather the ability to embed the construction uh, logic and the direction and methodologies directly in the pieces themselves, which I think represents like a next evolution of data and design through a furthering of technology. So the architect and builder can still be separate, but there's no longer this need to translate from idea to 2D orthographic projection and then back into 3D. It's all uh, developed within the 3D piece itself. Um, in this case, you know, no drawings are needed. So it's more like a furniture uh, Ikea piece. There's only one way it can go together. Uh, even though the project only comes together through its generic reading. So you can only understand the project through its assembly. No, uh, no single piece tells the entire story. So each piece is highly specific. It's necessary for the whole, but it doesn't tell the story until it's aggregated into the whole. Um, so the quality of any robust and transparent system in my mind is to create a vehicle that is capable of representing and absorbing all of these multiple types of data. In this case, the system or the design itself and the choices of units that can vary and mix all allow it for it to be accessible and inclusive of these various data streams rather than exclusive. And that's an important thing, I think, in all of the work I do. Um, and this way, more data can open up doors and, and really allow for the integration of other sources. Uh, so for many of our projects, we attempt to translate data in a way that fosters and promotes these overlaps. Uh, and therefore the potential for new and emergent conditions to, to, to come and representations and qualifications of the data to come through those overlapping um, data sources. Uh, so the second project is Machinic Domains. This is a project, an installation and exhibition I completed with Clay Odom and Benjamin Rice uh, for the Mebane Gallery at UT. Uh, the project was an armature for exhibiting various experiments that were done with the new KUKA ro robots. Um, the design is essentially these three units. Each unit was highly specific in its interior configuration, so how the different pieces came together internally, but uh, highly generic on its exterior, allowing a high degree of variability in its overall organization. So you can see um, in this slide, each piece uh, can connect in a number of different ways to other pieces or even, even replicas of itself. Um, so depending on which pieces connect to each other, the overall configuration completely changes, allowing real-time adjustments and the capacity to change the exhibition really any time of day. So you might have one configuration on one day and an entirely new one if you come back the second day. Um, so here are just three of the different varieties here. Um, so in each of these projects, tolerance becomes a central issue, especially in relation to data because the project's tolerance or its, allow, its, its ability to allow misalignment of parts is often determined by time. It used to be really an issue of assembly and, and construction uh, precision, but the precision of the CNC machines and the tools we're using robots have made that uh, idea of tolerance really secondary. So tolerance, at least for me, is primarily about how data streams, in this case, the sequence of assembly overlap in time. Um, and this next project, uh, Plume, is one that I'm also working on with Clay. It's a permanent art installation uh, with, um, uh, for the Austin Bergstrom Air Airport, really talks about this idea of sequence of assembly. So the project is essentially a um, very large, 20 foot tall, 3D printed matrix, and it's wrapped in a series of aluminum rods that are kind of outer sheathing. Um, the assembly of the 3D print in the outer shell requires a huge amount of coordination both of the systems are super precise. They're both machine fabricated, but both with their own levels of tolerance. And in this case, not only physical tolerance, but also tolerance over time and actually place uh, because the 3D prints being built in Tennessee and the rods are being built in Austin. So these things are happening simultaneously. Um, to work on, uh, so uh, basically the project is a, a large 3D printed matrix and it's um, wrapped with those rods and you can see it kind of here in this, this uh, slide on the right. And to deal with this, we work with a 3D digital model, a uh, highly accurate 3D scan as well. And the two are then joined in a separate 3D model where we can make changes based on any issues that come up, which is really critical because they're being constructed simultaneously. Um, there's a cavity between the two, which you can see over here, uh, allowing and accommodating for some discrepancies, but the ability to update the model quickly in real time and between multiple partners really reduces these issues considerably. So that the idea of coordinated real-time feedback is something you know, we're continuing to look at in future projects, especially by integrating new technology. Um, we're both working with the HoloLens, both Clay and I, which allows people for multiple locations to be present in the same design space or construction space simultaneously. So it really changes the, the idea of, of tolerance 
um, not only through now time, but also through place and space. So really quickly, I'll show this last project. This is um, Lumafoil, which was a collaboration with Clay, uh, an award-winning project in, uh, uh, for a competition in Florida International University, which unfortunately never got built. Uh, we had the best engineers in the, the world um, working on this. We had Arup working on this, but um, after that uh, bridge collapse at FIU, they, they really got nervous. So unfortunately the project stalled, I, th I think because of that um, event. But anyway, the project is a design for a, a new rooftop canopy for Bernard Schumi's School of Architecture project and specifically for this red generator building. Schumi designed this particular building as a shell for events, activities, and spatial effects. And the school also wanted, of course, a, a, a canopy to provide shade and help define a variety of spaces within this kind of empty container. So our project picks up on this idea of a generator by actualizing some of those hidden potential conditions that we felt were being telegraphed by the building itself internally and also externally. Um, so in this project, data becomes the projection, it's sunlight, it's also structure, it's movement of people, it's activities, it's ge geometry being projected and connections across space. And so much like on the wall, the project is a confluence of these different data streams augmenting and overlapping and superimposing with each other. The design is described through the sequence here is really the result of the integration of each of those conditions into the form and into the material uh, of the project. So um, I think this project uh, is really one of the better ones that shows how quantity, in this case, the number and variety of cells is being used to produce qualities um, within the space. So each part of the project, though it's highly specific and completely necessary to the whole, adds um, only adds up to something more when it's aggregated into the general uh, assembly. So in fact, the size, um, unfortunately this video is not playing, but the, the size and depth of each part is determined by the contribution that it plays to that larger system, not only for its ability to produce shadow, but also for its structural performance. And so in this one, you can see in the middle section, uh, the cells have to in decrease in size, but increase in depth to respond to some of those forces and also um, to create a, a, um, a, a more uh, protected from the sun area underneath it. So uh, with that, uh, thank you. And I think we can open up the discussion. And yeah, I think there's quite a bit of overlap actually between the three. <laughs> How do you wanna do it? Do I, I could start with a, a question for, um, maybe I'll start and ask Alex a question. Um, so, you know, I thought it was interesting, the, uh, the idea of having a simulated model, I'm still on the naive uh, idea of what data can do at that kind of scale. Like I, I probably am, am much like you were going into school where I feel like, yeah, if we have all the data, we can solve everything. Um, but I think what's interesting about it, um, and this, uh, I don't know if you read um, Vibrant Matter by Jane Bennett. She talks about in that book, The New York Blackout, and how all of the simulated models of uh, the New York electric grid never predicted the blackout. And it was actually a, a condition that just emerged through various processes that came together and could never be uh, actually simulated. So I wonder, you know, in modeling these very large systems, how do you simulate and predict what's unpredictable? You know, what is the behavior that, that actually emerges and actually transform the system in the most fundamental way that isn't actually part of that initial hypothesis that you would have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there are a couple things there. Um, one is, I think in the case of the ERCOT folks and in kind of uh, systems that are gonna be impacted by climate, I think that it's becoming clear that the historical data that we have about our systems are not super reliable. Like they can't be used in the same way that they were in the past, right? Planning for the 100 year event, like that 100 year event has now become a 10 year event or a one year event. And so like updating those prior understandings, um, I think is, is super important. And just like, we're gonna have to start getting away from um, like using events that have actually occurred in the past and just thinking more broadly about like what are the worst possible things that we can imagine, right? Like if we actually take climate seriously, if we look um, kind of around uh, at what's going on across the country and around the world, like these assumptions that we're plugging into our models are just, 
are just wrong. Um, of course, there will, those, there will still be black swan events um, that we cannot predict. And so uh, some things that I've been exploring in my work are rather than looking 20 and 30 years into the future, just kind of admitting that, ad admitting some kind of ignorance, right? Like we, we can't possibly know what will happen in 20 or 30 years. We can put forward a series of projections and try to have some kind of uncertainty bands and, and that's all well and good. But I think that the models actually have a really um, substantial value in looking at current conditions. So I work on public transit systems, for example. Um, and it, the example holds for kind of, uh, if you're looking at a more integrated transportation and land use system. But you could look at, for example, like Project Connect in Austin, right? This $7 billion public transit expansion plan that we have that's gonna roll out over 15 or 20 or 30 years. We can make a lot of assumptions about what Austin is gonna look like at that time and then predict some outcomes. But I think there's also value in looking at, okay, well, if we implemented Project Connect right now, given the existing transportation and land use system that we have, we just kind of layer Project Connect on top. We know where everyone lives um, in Austin. We know their socioeconomic characteristics. What would the outcomes be today? And that actually gives us pretty important information um, about how people in Austin, given their residential characteristics and socioeconomics, how we kind of value them. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking more about using models instead of projecting out 20 and 30 years, kind of looking more near term, where we have much more certainty about what, kind of, what the kind of existing conditions are and what the impacts will be. I don't know, my son Marla unmuted, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no, I was just thinking about the idea of simulation and virtualization and the difference like Corey was talking about between the amount of data and the ability to predict what's going to happen, you know, in terms of what you were talking about and the difference between like doing it with a building and doing it with a huge process, you know, like transportation or that kind of thing and the differences that it makes because really when we're working with virtualizing a building, which is basically what we're doing with a lot of the programs that we are, it's we're working with the here and now, right, Corey, like we're like, okay, what is what is happening exactly at this moment and the data flow that goes in and out of that is very restrictive, even though to me it seems that it can seem overwhelming. So the difference between the two and the complexity of the two to me is really interesting. The difference in the way that you organize or choose which, you know, like you said, which data you, you focus on, like the historical data is no longer relevant, you know, like that is really interesting to me. That's really like that we've gone beyond that, you know, that suddenly we've sort of been what we used to assume was our foundation is now gone. You know? mm -hmm. I'm really interested in, in like how artificial intelligence starts to affect simulation because, you know, part of simulation is just the, the part of the, the failure of it in some ways is our inability to predict these emergent conditions. And what artificial intelligence might prove to do is to create so many simulations, just a, a tenfold or you know, billionfold increase of all of the different models that it can use to predict, that it might be once we hit that near future scenario that has been predicted through some of these artificial intelligence systems that we you know, maybe couldn't conceive of ourselves. So I'm, I'm curious how those, the creativity that exists within artificial intelligence might actually predict, be able to predict longer term simulations based on that feedback. Yeah, I mean, I think there's diminishing returns in terms of increasing complexity. Like the, the models that I'm most familiar with, these travel demand and land use models, they're already so complex that the agencies that work with them can't deal with them in-house. So they always have to hire outside consultants to operate and maintain them, um, which introduces a whole host of um, issues in terms of community engagement and participation that I think are problematic. But um, like it, it's not clear to me that increasing complexity is actually um, the answer actually gets us um, closer to where we need to be. Um, but certainly this is one value of being in the university. Um, there's, there's also academic interest in these things. So if there is something that bubbles up to the top and actually seems to be useful, then it could potentially be distributed or disseminated to practice. Um, I wanna follow up on something that Martha said earlier though, which um, uh, I think is really resonated with me, which was this idea that we have, I think you were talking about these uh, building information models mm -hmm. that are getting kind of increasingly complex and can do 3D renderings, but you're using them to do better 2D. Yeah. So using 
these kind of new technologies to do a better job at um, things that you would have used different right. for um, in the past. I wonder if you could just expand on that um, a little bit because that I, I feel like there's some overlap with um, some some sure. so, things that I've been thinking about as well. So one of the, I mean, I think it's it kind of goes back to different levels of data awareness. You know, like um, you might be be data aware, data savvy, and all those sort of different categories. And so one of the lower echelon uses of building information modeling is to take it and use it as a very sophisticated 2D drawing generator that organizes the data that we've always used in a more efficient way, right? And it does that very well. Like it actually releases a lot of traditional architectural detailing. Um, and so in class, we talk about that. You know, we talk about we're actually the irony of somebody made a BIM model of this, they made drawings of it, and now we're making another BIM model of it, right? And we're, we're looking at coordination issues that happen within that system and then talking about how to move past that, like that it's not just a cool way to make better drawings, it's just not more efficient, but like once you move past sort of the data savvy into the data driven or more intelligently into the process, at least that's what I was trying to express is like once you can control the process and start to understand how to adjust those parameters and not just use them as they are, you can start to really push everything around and start to do, you know, like Corey's doing, like direct to fabrication, start to actually introduce your own data in different streams, you know, through different plugins and things like that. So one of the major uh, frustrations for me in the short term with building information modeling is that it's really just a better mousetrap for some people, which is fine, but then it loses really sort of what the potential of what it could be. And there seems to be a big gap. I don't know if, if anybody else in architecture seems to see that. It's like, there's the people that use it as as a better mousetrap, and then there's the generative design. You know, there seems to be like in that middle ground, a sort of missing area of transition for me, but that could be just me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess should open it up. It looks like Michelle has a question. <laughs> You know, I can't help myself, but but this this one's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I'm I'm Alan Shearer might be the only one who who knows this, but um, you know, I was part of the the team at NASA that developed the first um, uh, uh, numerical uh, computer um, finite element program in the world, uh, which was NASTRAN. And then uh, years later, I was the one of the first uh, in the world to apply finite element analysis to submicron scale uh, heat transfer. It took two weeks on a supercomputer to look at one centimeter. And so one of the things that comes up a lot, and this actually, I'm fascinated by this group of three because I think it's exactly sort of like the, the right perspectives that we should have at the table with this. One of the things that, that has always been, um, you know, omnipresent within my branch of, of how uh, we do simulation and modeling has been the, the conflict between stochastic modeling and physical modeling. Uh, the, the, the ability to, you know, actually uh, do direct modeling of physical processes, we're capable of doing that but it's at extraordinary, uh, extraordinary cost. And by extraordinary cost, it's, it's both uh, computational cost um, uh, as well as sort of like we can, we can look at tiny fragments uh, within that. And stochastic modeling is this way to sort of like pack data, you know, into it to, to basically statistically fill in where we're actually able to simulate uh, the physical processes of it. And I think what's really interesting about what the, the areas that Alex is talking about is that, you know, it's, it's not talking about a single physical phenomenon. Uh, there's multiple types of physical phenomena uh, that, that have to be looked at when you're looking at those kinds of scenarios. So it's multiple kinds. Uh, at the same time, there are the things that are not physical phenomena. We're dealing with human behavior. Um, we're, we're dealing with a whole, we're, we're dealing with sort of like 
economics models. They're, they are different types of, of structures in terms of, of how we analyze things. And, and then, you know, I think about, which I, I'm more, even more fascinated by, by BIM than I ever have been before. Because one of the beauties about BIM is that it's not really a model, it's a platform. You know, it's a framework that allows you to sort of allows you to sort of organize all of these different things. Now, granted, the organization looks like a building. You know, the organization looks like it's the uh, the, the two dimensional and three dimensional representations of a building. But that's the organization of both the data and the different kinds of models on that. And you know, uh, and as much as we rail against the juggernaut uh, that is Autodesk. Uh, you know, BIM, uh, you know, Revit has become a lingua franca that uh, not only sort of allows multiple differential entities to connect to each other, uh, but allows multiple differential models. And I love the idea that it's it's now accessible to Rhino and Grasshopper. I think that's going to be a, a big game changer for it. But I'm beginning to wonder, you know, if there is an ability, you know, it's it's still small if you think about what it does. It it still is about having the 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 fundamental thing of it, you know, as Marla was saying in terms of the here and now, is actually it's still about a physical building, you know. So it still has what we consider to be the boundary conditions really clearly defined, you know, what what the limits are really clearly defined on that. And I'm wondering how we begin now to sort of like operate through these different ways of how we model and conceive and whether or not this kind of framework thinking of what might be be laid out would be something we could think about writ larger for some of our different fields is what should we be putting our energy in actually building the engine or the framework um, and, and less into sort of like the discrete modeling for right now, but would, would something like that be helpful for some of these really multimodal types of problems where, where it is more than the resolution that takes place uh, at a building scale? May I could add just one comment, which I think, you know, we're starting to do in Plume um, in terms of balancing the stochastic model versus the simulation using the HoloLens. I mean, I think that is a territory that's super interesting because you are, you're augmenting reality. Um, so you are building virtually in physical space. Um, and by doing so, that virtual element can start to, you can start to embed physical properties, the representation of physical properties within that. So you can you know, embed elasticity in the digital model, gravity, these kind of conditions that might affect the difference between a physical model and a simulation I think are becoming closer to each other through these kind of technologies. So I think it remains to be seen, but I also think it's a scalable technology. I mean, if you look at where it's being used, it's not really actually so much in the construction industry. It's in simulating environmental impacts, environmental effects, and really about coordination, coordinating people and, and, and uh, people power. So coordinating, you know, um, bringing up skilled labor quickly and on site is is uh, one example where you don't need no need to train any longer. You can actually have a supervisor built into that that lens who's training you as you construct. So removing that kind of gap of experience is interesting. But yeah, I think like that might be a territory where these things start to come together and and span different disciplines. Uh, we have a question from Sarah. Sarah, if you're on here and want to ask, feel free, or I can read it as well in the chat. Um, I see you here. I'll, I'll read it. Um, how do you talk about the ethics of data and the choices you have to make with your students? From the input selection level to the end result, there's so much room for variance in approach, who gets addressed, lost, et cetera, in the analysis. I'll just say quickly, um, this is definitely something that I talk about. Um, and it's, I think, making students aware of this before they go out into the uh, professional world um, is super important. The areas in which I work in environmental justice and kind of civil rights and equity become super important. Um, 
especially when you'll have you have a client who has um, a certain uh, desired goal or a particular point of view um, that clients um, goals might conflict with those um, put forward by uh, stakeholders from the community. Um, and so just uh, making students aware that the specific decisions that they make about input data, about how an environmental justice community is defined, about the particular performance measure that they calculate, um, those things are all going to have an effect on the ultimate outcome, right? Whether a project has a significant environmental effect or whether a project has a disproportionate impact on um, communities of color, or low-income communities. Um, and it's gonna be, I mean, I make it clear that it's gonna be hard for them to push back on that if they're getting paid by someone, I mean, if it's their employer or a client, um, but at least kind of raising those issues um, in the classroom and sensitizing, sensitizing them uh, to them uh, is important. Uh, we have a question from Alicia and then Cisco. Uh, hi, um, so I'm an architecture student. I have a background in computer science. And I think one thing that I've noticed with respect to all these conversations is like the tendency for people to see the computer as like a neutral actor with agency and to use it to justify decisions that are really being made by humans and like how do you think that people working with data should position themselves around the decisions that they're making? Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, um, yeah, I totally agree with you. I think, yeah, you, you, um, you can't, you can't uh, use data um, that you generate as an author, or you choose as an author to defend a kind of a larger position. And so I think, that is the key is to be clear on what that data is. Is it data just to generate some effect? Is it, gener is it generating a light condition, a, uh, you know, some kind of performative thing like a, a louver system? You can't make claims, I think, that go beyond the data that you're using. And I think it's something that I'm aware of and, and try to teach my students, but it is a, a major issue with data usage. I think another thing you said, Corey, is really important, just like being like data should be, I think you said data should be transparent or something about transparency. Because this this is something that I've seen in my work too. Just working with agencies, they'll say, "Oh well, you know, the computer, the model made me do it, or like the computer spit out this particular mm -hmm. number." But of course, like you made the computer do that. Um, so one way that I've tried to help mitigate that effect is just uh, positioning myself as a researcher, as a bridge between members of the public who are trying to engage in a process that is informed by data or simulation um, and helping them to understand what the kind of weaknesses are, what the model can and cannot do and what other data can be brought to bear on the, the problem. But like as members of the public, we have to kind of be pushing back on folks who are saying that, oh, like, you know, this number just came out of the computer, therefore it's true. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think of what I said in the beginning about uh, my attitude towards the tools is that a, a relationship that sounds a little strange like I develop a personal relationship with these tools but I'm also aware that they have a point of view like they've been coded by somebody else you know that there are constraints that have already been placed on us that we are working within and that one of the things that I I think I try to uh, tell my students is that it's just as important to know when not to use a tool than when to use a tool and when the tool fails you know to do what you're hoping it to, it will do and not just take that data and use it to whatever end you have to look somewhere else or, or admit that it's or understand at that point that it's not working for you. Yeah. Let's go, go for it. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it seems like data is so valuable. There's tremendous socioeconomic forces against its transparency. And maybe I'm, I'm worried, I'm cynical about the, the ability for, I mean, it's hard to imagine Palantir, you know, disclosing whatever data they're, they're using to do their calculations uh, to, the, to the world in general. But that's not my question. I wanted to ask a question about, um, uh, it was something Alex brought up in the, the comment he made uh, the time before last, but also Alicia uh, referenced, which is, um, Maybe this falls into the broad category of what, what is knowable or what is predictable if you consider that as what is knowable about the future state of the world. But um, all of you um, talked about, well, Alex, you didn't talk about it so explicitly, but I'm assuming you're in the same category. Like Marla, you're talking about the structures that, you know, 
that the, your students work with in sort of creating the actual artifact that results in that. And Corey, in that last project you're talking about, you know, the relationship between creating shade and, you know, structural depth to span and things like that. I'm assuming, Alex, that in your models, you're also aware and manipulating sort of the relationships between um, aspects of that predictive model. Um, but, and this is not my area, so this might be a naive question, but, you know, when you read about machine learning and things like that, there is this idea that um, we may not be fully aware, that we likely won't be fully aware of the mechanisms within the algorithms or the learning that the machines generate. And then the whole question about equity and kind of the relationships between, um, you know, if we don't even know what those are and how those predictions or those results are being generated, that becomes a much more challenging question. And so I guess my question is for you collectively is how comfortable, how comfortable, you know, we may be, how comfortable are you with not being in control of the algorithms or the relationships that actually are, that are being used within the computations to create the work that you're doing, whether it be predictions or, or physical proposals? Yeah, I'm not comfortable with that. And that's, I think that's why machine learning in particular is problematic um, because it takes those relationships and just makes them completely opaque. Whereas traditional statistical modeling, the, the one goal of traditional statistical modeling is to make those relationships clear and transparent and say like, this is exactly how this particular variable affects um, the output. Um, so yeah, I think that that, um, the the rise of machine learning um, makes me very worried. And also uh, this is kind of related to some things we were discussing before, but I just think like this push for more uh, technically sophisticated models, especially think, just thinking just about transportation land use. I have no idea how this applies to BIM or architecture, but in, on the transportation side, in terms of climate, we know exactly the things that we need to do that can nudge people's transportation choices in a certain direction, that can make their commute distances shorter, that can encourage them to ride bikes or walk or take public transit, um, right? We have to make those things convenient, accessible, affordable. Uh, we have to put housing near public transit. Like we know all of the things we need to do. So I just don't think we need a model to tell us what the outcomes will be. We just, we just need to start doing those things. And so Project Connect is a, is a great step in that direction. Like we're just kind of doing it um, and we know the kind of directions that it will kind of pull us in. But um, in that sense, like we know what those relationships are right now. We know what the near-term impacts are likely to be. So I don't need a machine learning model to tell me what the impacts will be in 30 years. Um, but, but yeah, I think that the, the rise of machine learning makes me worried um, both in academia and in, in practice. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, um, you know there's that uh, example where they fed in a bunch of information from Google and it produced like just really horrible, you know, really, um, you know, not only biased, but just like really insensitive text because it was taking from its source all of the things that we say online. And so I think whenever you work with machine learning, artificial intelligence, it's the data set that is critical. It's not going to produce something that wasn't somehow inside of the data set that you fed it. So I think the transparency of that data set becomes critical. So it's not one person's biased opinion of how they collect that information, but it's a community that can, can filter it in a way that, you know, um, is, is, is transparent. But the one thing I would say, like about climate change, is that, you know, it's kind of what Timothy Morton refers to as, as a hyper object or a, a, pro a problem that's so large that we can't really even conceive of it. And I think the pandemic is similar. And my worry is that if we continue, even with the things we know we can do, it isn't enough. Like, I think we need to conceive of altogether higher order um, uh, things that we might not be able to think of just as people that maybe an artificial intelligence or machine learning might start to provide some, some direction in. So yeah, I'm super skeptical, super nervous of it, but I also think it might be necessary at one point in time when we can no longer, uh, the little things we can do can no longer add up to something that will you know, affect change. Yeah, I think I would agree with Corey and just in terms of the idea of something that is not conceivable you know, and is so com and maybe comes from so many different variables that might be out there that we would take so long to find or that would 
you know, ch make, a game, make a change that's significant is compelling, you know, in terms of like wanting to run a simulation that could potentially come up with something like that. However, I also tend to fall back on what I said before, which is that, and what you guys are talking about is that the, the data set is a data set. So it's gonna, it's gonna get what it gets from the data set. And then the constraints maybe are created by someone else, but are evolving with machine learning. And so there's something there that is changing, which is really more of the constraints in the process that's rearranging the, the data set. So I think there's a lot of limitations that come with it and a lot of unknowns. I also think like what Alex is talking about in terms of Project Connect and what we were talking about before, like the, the, the collapse of like the time that we're looking at makes a big difference like if machine learning needs to look 30 years in the distance like maybe maybe we are down to three years and we know what's going to happen and it's and we just make those incremental changes over time which seems interesting to me is a different way of looking at modeling because we have a, i've always sort of looked at statistical modeling in the long term so well we are a bit over time at this point so i want to be respectful of folks who have to go to studio and have other commitments but this was fabulous. I want to thank you all so much for for joining today and for being willing to present this week after all the chaos of last week. And I hope that the dialogue continues among you three and for for anyone else interested. Thank you all. Thanks, Leora. Thanks for organizing. Oh, thank you. Absolutely.